So, James, we're here today to talk about your book, which is called The Information, with the subtitle A History, A Theory, A Flood. Can you talk to us a bit about what the book is about and, and what that subtitle denotes? Because it's an unusual one. Well, I'll start in the middle, because the book starts in the middle with the theory. There is a theory of information, a scientific theory, that, um, that most people haven't heard of. It's a little bit under the radar. It's not like the Higgs boson. You know, We're all down with that these days. Yeah. Yes, that's right. <laughs> information theory was born in 1948, and it is a scientific theory of this stuff called information, and it has its own unit of measure, the bit, the fundamental particle of the science of information. And I became aware of this as a science writer about 25 years ago when I was working on my first book, Chaos, and had it in the back of my head as something I needed to learn more about. And then we all know what's happened over the last 25 years. The information age has exploded around us. It's a cliche to say that we're living in the information age. People have been calling it the information age now for 50 years. What I think we've learned, though, is that all of human history has been an information age. Information is the blood and the fuel of the world. It's as if, to, to mix metaphors, it's as if we are a species of fish that has finally, at this point in our history, discovered there's such a thing as water. Most of our communications channels these days are invisible, and we don't even think about them. Twitter is a communications channel, and the television channels of the broadcast networks are communications channels, but in their essence, they can be reduced to something as simple as a, as a tube of air, and I can speak into this mouthpiece, and with any luck, Sarah will be able to hear me over there on the purple channel. Okay, Sarah, can you hear me? Yes. Is there too much noise interfering with the message? No, it's not. My accent is not Not, no, not too bad. It's amazing. It's kind of like we're having the two tin cans on the end of a string when you're a child. But you said that in 1948 um, the, the theory appeared. What, what triggered that? Where did that come from? It, it actually had, it was the end of a long, slow burn, and it was born at Bell Labs in the U.S., in the telecommunications labs, um, although it was instantly a sensation in England as well. And, and it arose with a lot of other stuff called cybernetics and related things where suddenly engineers and mathematicians were particularly concerned with coming up with ways to, to describe, well, the transmission of stuff across telephone wires. Mm. Before that, telegraph signals. These were uh, technical problems for electrical engineers, but suddenly people became aware that the stuff that was being transmitted was all of a kind. Dots and dashes, the sound of the human voice, converted into analog electrical waves, and then newer technologies like television and radio, all of these things were transmitting a kind of stuff. It was all one thing, it's information. And we understand that now because we carry it around in our pockets. Mm -hmm. We store it on CDs, you know, uh, little disks of, of silicon engraved with laser dots. But um, what we're talking about here, it seems to me, is um, technology. We're talking about the, the technology which we use to transmit information. Um, so what's the history part of it then? What happened before we got all the computers and the silicon well, chips? Well, what, what we're able to see now, now that we're, we're, we're information sophisticates, is that um, these new technologies, the technologies that, that we think are so cool, you know, the thing that's buzzing in my pocket right now. And you should turn it off, Wilfred. <laughs> <laughs> you have one too, admit it. Um, uh, the computers uh, are, are the end of a line, not the end, but the, the point we've reached yeah. in a line that goes back to not just the telephone and the telegraph, but before that, the printing press, and before that, the invention of writing. That's a technology. Mm. It's an information technology. It's, a, a, in its absolute essence, a, a, a mechanical way of preserving and storing information and transmitting it across space and time. Wow. My book actually star starts with a technology that most people haven't heard of. 
what? This, this drum is from New Guinea. I write in the book about drum languages of Africa, right. where the first, European, the first Europeans to arrive in Africa were mystified to discover that Africans had a communications technology that was more sophisticated and more powerful than anything that existed in Europe at that time, wow. because this was before the invention of the electric telegraph. Right. It was a long time dream of humanity to have a way of communicating over vast mm -hmm. distances. And at first, Europeans in Europe, because they tended to be slavers and not anthropologists, were slow to catch on to how powerful the drum languages were. Anything that you could express in human language could be converted into these drum signals. Mm. It doesn't look like, I mean, you know, if, yeah, if I came upon it, I would have certainly no idea still now that this was anything to do with communication no at all. it doesn't look like much and no. and people could hear the drummers with these complex patterns of sounds there are only two notes high and low and they thought it was decorative or it was musical or it was something they didn't give the natives credit for anything especially sophisticated but in fact there was a complex code um, that enabled them to to say anything at all and the messages are absolutely beautiful and even up until the most recent times, there, I, I think there are still people in Africa who can communicate via drums. But of course, um, the, the continent has made a leap from the drum languages to the mobile telephone very quickly. So do you think Samuel Morse took some inspiration from this then? No, Samuel Morse didn't know anything about right. it. So but you're right, it's exactly the same parallel. problem. Mm. It's exactly the same two thing. Notes. It's a binary language, two notes. How do you convert human language into a binary code? In his case, to be sent across a telegraph wire. In this case, to be sent often by pairs of drummers in relays up, a, up the course of a river on a dark night. So is, is writing the earliest technology that we have then for this, or can you trace it back even further? No, I think, I think you would say that writing is the first technology of information. I mean, you can say that, that the invention of speech was a sort of technology, but I think that might be stretching the word a little bit. I won't get into that argument. <laughs> Obviously, this is just one way of looking at history, but it does make history sound like um, the human act of striving towards better transmission of information. Is that how you see it? Yes, better transmission of information, better interaction with one another, a, a better approach to knowledge, because we know that knowledge and information aren't the same thing. Okay, do we? Can you explain that? Well, I think we know that more acutely now than ever. You know, we, we're, we're getting to the, the last word of my subtitle, the flood. Mm. We know that we're deluged with information. We're, we're floating in a sea of bits, but um, we don't necessarily feel any smarter, do we? And, I don't. <laughs> and we worry about finding the stuff that we need in this, in this morass. So have you then come up with a theory for what we do next, for how we filter all of this information that we're suddenly presented with? No, I, I haven't. Uh, this is not a how-to manual in any way. I, I think we are going to continue stumbling forward. That's what I'm doing anyway. I, I think we're, even, even at our darkest moments when we are complaining most bitterly, I feel that most of us are finding new ways through. I mean, we sign up for Twitter, and we think when we do that, 140 characters, how absurd. Nobody can say anything profound. And furthermore, there are a billion tweets a day. Somewhere out there, people are saying things of great interest to me, and I can't possibly find them. Mm. And yet, it's a tool, and we use it, and we communicate with our friends, and we find people to follow, and they become our personal curators of the day's news, or, or at least a source of jokes. And um, we, we manage somehow. Mm.